All right, well, welcome everybody to, um, and good afternoon to the uh, Australian Institute of Physics Theoretical Physics Seminar Series for 2022. Uh, I'm David Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at ANU, and I'm hosting this series of seminars on behalf of the Australian Institute of Physics. I need to start as always by acknowledging the people of the Ngunnawal Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands upon which ANU and indeed all of Canberra and Australia is located. And we of course acknowledge the traditional owners of lands all around Australia. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past and present. Last time we had a fascinating talk uh, from Professor Howard Weissman from Griffith University on the metaphysics, if you like, of uh, quantum mechanics and indeed on the implications for our philosophical interpretation of quantum mechanics based on new quantum mechanical theoretical and experimental results. It was a fascinating talk and I recommend it to you if you're interested in those sorts of topics. Uh, that seminar, indeed all of our seminars from this year and the seminars from last year are available to watch on the AIP YouTube channel. Today's talk is on a somewhat different but uh, equally fascinating topic of neutrino oscillations. Um, as many of you would be aware, the possibility of neutrinos changing flavor was predicted many decades ago on the basis of theoretical arguments, and it was subsequently confirmed by many experiments. In essence, the neutrino is regarded as a superposition of neutrino flavors, the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. In the absence of a complete theoretical model, for a long time, the field consisted of a a series of experiments to determine a set of parameters by means of which the wavelength and the magnitude of this, of this, this superposition could be determined. Um, and by about 2018, I think it's true to say, there was a more or less consensus as to the values of these parameters. If I'm wrong about that, Surabhati will correct me. Um, specifically, the masses of the three neutrinos and the so-called mixing angle. But in 2018, the situation changed a little bit with results from the Mini Boone experiment carried out at Fermilab in the United States, which confirmed the existence of an anomaly which had been seen previously in the LSDN, so-called the liquid scintillator neutrino experiment that had been done a couple of decades earlier at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And the combined results from these two experiments disagreed with the consensus of the global fit at that time. Uh, potentially, these results have far-reaching consequences because it was difficult. It is probably difficult. We'll hear a lot more about this. Uh, to um, assuming that the experiments themselves are understood correctly, it's it's difficult to come up with an interpretation which probably uh, doesn't reside outside of the standard model of particle physics. So, to explain a lot more about this and the current status of the field, our speaker today is Professor Surabhati Goswami. Professor Goswami is Professor of Physics at the Physical Research Laboratory in, uh, in Ahmedabad in India, having taken her PhD in neutrino oscillations at the University of Calcutta. She has conducted research into neutrino oscillations, both in the Physical Research Laboratory at the Saha Institute of Theoretical Physics and at the Harish Chandra Research Institute. Professor Goswami is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences India and the Indian National Science Academy. Her talk today is entitled Latest Developments and Challenges in Neutrino Physics. Over to you, please, Srabhati. Thank you very much for that introduction. Let me just share the screen and my talk. I would like to thank uh, Professor Mare and also Archil for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak in this forum. You know, I, I visited Sydney in 2019 and that was my last abroad trip uh, before the world, you know, went into a frenzy because of this pandemic. And, uh, and it's uh, nice to talk to you. And I thought that uh, um, I, uh, I, uh, when I was asked to talk about the recent developments and challenges, I thought it would be a good thing to see what happened in between this period on which, you know, at least some part of the talk can be devoted to that. Um, although I say neutrino physics, uh, 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 is there an echo or is it all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 
so i hope that um, i will be able to um, uh, at least uh, give convince you that you know it is a really a very vast field and to talk about the whole neutrino physics in this uh, time scale is not possible so i have chosen the um, liberty to uh, talk mainly about neutrino oscillation physics and some amount of uh, what we call the beyond standard model physics so i start with the standard model which is the you know bread and butter of all particle physicists it describes the uh, fundamental particles and their interactions and the lagrangian can be written actually in a t cup and uh, the elementary particles are quarks and leptons and uh, the higgs boson which was discovered some years back is responsible for giving mass to these particles and the uh the particles take part in uh, strong weak and electromagnetic interactions which is governed by these uh, mediators w z photon and gluon now a neutrino is an elementary particle belonging to the standard model you can see there is mu mu and mu tau three types of neutrinos in the standard model neutrinos are massless and they take part only in weak interaction which is mediated by the w and the z boson so as i said there are three types of neutrinos and they are so classified in terms of their interactions so when an electron type of neutrino interacts it produces an electron which is a charged lepton when a muon type of neutrino interacts it produces a muon and when a tau type of neutrino interacts it produces a tau so that's how they are made, named electron muon and tau neutrino Uh, one of the you know very uh, topical question is are there more and i hope that i will be able to talk uh, some more about this uh, thing that whether there are more than three neutrinos so neutrinos can come from uh, various sources spanning a large range of energy so we have the um, neutrinos coming from big bang which uh, constitutes a cosmic neutrino background these are very low energy around 10 to the minus 2 electron volt then we have energies coming from sun and supernova explosions these are in the mev range then atmospheric neutrinos in the gev range um, and several uh, gev then then we can have galactic and extra galactic sources of very high energy neutrinos coming from astrophysical objects high energy cosmic rays etc so these are the natural sources uh, there are also man made neutrinos from um, reactor uh, or accelerator beams and also there is a geo neutrino flux which was detected which comes from the radioactivity of the earth so it spans as you can see a very large range of energy and allows us to explore the universe at different energy scales now the neutrino detection is uh, difficult because neutrinos are very weakly interacting for instance to stop a neutrino one needs lead shielding of 100 light years but for x rays it is like 0.24 mm so like uh, there are trillions of neutrinos per second passing through our body but you know there may be will be one interaction in 100 years and this is a huge detector we need huge detectors to have a reasonable number of interactions and we need to go deep underground to cut down on background processes which can mimic a signal because it produces a charged lepton so we have to cut down the background processes and also we need to collect uh, large statistics to have any meaningful conclusion so one needs to data over large period of time so it needs lot of patience to work on in this uh, field so one example is the super kamiokande detector which is the world's largest detector in japan and this is a 50 kiloton it it uses water so it is a 50 kiloton water detector and you can see the active detector element is photomultiplier tube and you can see these are physicists of super kamiokande um, uh, and uh, you know working on these photomultiplier tubes and you can see the size and with this huge size it observes about 30 neutrinos per day so if it is uh, so difficult to catch the neutrino then the question arises that why should we try to catch them 
so first of all as i have said that they are everywhere they are coming from natural sources free and they span a wide energy range and another fact is that because they are weakly interacting they carry information from stars for instance this is a neutrino coming from the sun and this is a photon so the photon interacts in the sun so it gets trapped and it goes in a zigzag path but neutrino can come straight so for instance it can give us information on the solar core which no other electromagnetic radiation source has uh, given and another uh, is that the neutrinos pose which is very interesting from the point of view of particle physics is that they pose interesting puzzles so as professor mare mentioned that uh, it is found that neutrinos can change flavor after passing through a distance so supposing from a source i have a new mu and after passing through a distance it can converted get converted to a new tau so and this is the this conversion probability can be oscillatory and this is called neutrino oscillation and this is possible if neutrinos have mass and mixing so i will discuss little more about neutrino oscillation supposing neutrinos have mass then nu mu and nu tau which are the states which are produced by weak interaction decays they are not uh, particles of finite mass but they are a superposition of the light and the heavy states and light and the heavy states are the neutrinos of definite mass which propagates now the question is how does the superposition of mass states evolve in vacuum so what happens is as the neutrino travels with energy e the heavier part will fall behind the lighter part so, so at the birth there is a certain proportion of the heavy and the light neutrino states which makes it a new mu but after traveling if this that proportion is changed due to this phase difference then what happens is this is no longer a pure new mu but it is a mixture of new mu and new tau and the neutrino oscillation was first proposed by um, russian uh, physicist uh, pontikorv and uh, that was um, uh, long back uh, even neutrino um, oscillations were observed he he had proposed this so he it was a very insightful suggestion from him that neutrinos can change flavor now uh, i said that the probability can be oscillatory and one has to calculate the probability and it's uh, not it's very easy to calculate the probability it's like simple uh, superposition and simple quantum mechanical calculation so here i write in general that the flavor states are superposition of mass eigen states this u is called the neutrino mixing matrix because it mixes between different flavors and if i consider two flavor then it has a simple representation cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta and nu1 nu2 are the light and heavy states that i told the mass eigen states and we can generalize this to more than two flavors and then what happens is this use some combination of this uh, mixing matrix element comes and also it depends on sin square delta ij where delta ij is depends on the mass square difference of the uh, neutrinos the uh, length uh, that they are traversing and the energy of the neutrinos and delta m square ij is defined m i square minus m j square so if i have the new one and new two then i can write this as delta m square 2 1 and then this is very simple this um, uh, this general expression takes a very com uh, simple form that probability of new e going to new mu is given by sin square 2 theta which is the mixing angle times sin square delta m square l by 4 e so this is the oscillatory term and sin square 2 theta is the um, amplitude term now uh, this from this simple expression we can see two things one is that this is not sensitive to the sign of sorry something is missing here but i will tell you this is delta m square so i said delta m square is m1 square minus m2 square and since we have sin square i don't know whether m2 is higher than m1 or m1 is higher than m2 because this is insensitive to that and this is not sensitive to octant of this mixing angle theta because this theta it is sin square 2 theta so theta can be less than 45 or theta can be greater than 45 and that is what i mean by octant and you can also see that it 
it is not sensitive to absolute masses because it depends only on the mass square difference. So neutrino oscillation is like an interference uh, phenomena, quantum mechanical, and this mass square difference, you know, takes the place of the phase difference. So this is the uh, the different energy because of the different mass, the energies uh, of the propagating neutrinos become different because they are relativistic. So they become different and that creates a phase difference. And when we go to um, now, apart from the neutrinos in the standard model, we also have the three anti neutrinos. And when we go from neutrino to anti neutrino, then in this probability, the U changes sign, U goes to U star. So that's how we can get the anti-neutrino probabilities from the neutrino probabilities. And this is the neutrino oscillation in vacuum. I will discuss later what happens when the neutrinos are passing through matter. Now, neutrino oscillation have been observed from solar, atmospheric, reactor, and accelerator experiments. It started from the observation of solar neutrinos in a experiment by Raymond Davies and pioneered by Raymond Davies and Bacall in the Homestake mine in US. And they were using 37 chlorine to observe the solar neutrinos. And the main idea was to test the hypothesis of solar energy generation in the sun, because they thought that if, the, if, the, if they catch the neutrinos by calculating the number of neutrinos, they can say whether the hypothesis is correct or not, because the main reaction, the PP chain, which produces the heat and light from the sun also produces neutrinos. However, what they found was that the only one third of the neutrinos are coming. And that started the solar neutrino problem. There are many new experiments which joined this endeavor, but it continued and uh, it's, uh, it continued for almost 30 years. And finally, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada uh, put a definitive, um, provided a definitive solution. And the earlier detector were all sensitive to the electron neutrinos, which were coming from the sun. But Sudbury had a neutral current reaction, which is sensitive to all three flavors of neutrinos. So they measured this ratio, the CC by NC, the nu E by nu E plus nu mu plus nu tau. And if there is indeed the nu E's are going to nu mu plus nu tau, this will be less than one. And they measured the ratio to be less than one. So that's how the solar neutrino, the solute neutrino oscillation solution to the solar neutrino, neutrino flavor conversion was established. And this was later confirmed by the Camland reactor neutrino experiment. And similarly, the atmospheric neutrino, um, uh, also there was some uh, problem issue with the atmospheric neutrinos. It seemed that in atmosphere, we have the new mu uh, as the um, new mu oscillations to new tau. And uh, this is the super Kamiokande data, which shows that this blue is the data and this uh, blue is the theoretical prediction, red is the data. So it is showing that in one side, when the neutrinos are passing through the earth, the um, data is not matching the theory and green is the new mu new tau oscillation solution. And this was later confirmed by the accelerator neutrino experiments. In fact, in 2015, Nobel Prize was given to Takaki Kajita of Super Kamiokande and uh, uh, Art MacDonald of uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory for, uh, for discovery of neutrino oscillation, which showed neutrinos have mass. So neutrino oscillation have been established and uh, now with more data from reactor experiments, the three neutrino paradigm is established. So the three neutrino oscillation is characterized by three mixing angles. These are called theta two, three, theta one, three, and theta one, two. So I have three states, one, two, three, and I can have mixing between these states. So each state is a composition of different flavors, as I said. And this one, two sector was measured mainly by the solar and the cam land, and this two, three by the atmospheric and long baseline. And this theta one three was measured mainly by the reactor neutrinos. And when the, in 2013, theta one three was measured as non-zero, then the three flavor paradigm was well established because theta one three is also um, affects the solar oscillation and the atmospheric oscillation. But you can see that theta one two and theta, 
theta 2 3 does not affect the solar oscillation and the theta 1 2 affects the atmospheric oscillation only at a subleading level so uh, all these experiments can tell us about these uh, parameters now here i have um, arranged these three neutrino mass states in two ways in one in which the third state is above the um, uh, first two states, which is called the normal mass ordering or normal hierarchy. And the other in which the third state is below the, one, the two states, it, it is called the inverted ordering. And um, this is the, you know, the current situation of the neutrino oscillation parameters. And it has been, uh, most of the parameters have been measured with quite a precision. So we have gone from the discovery era to the precision era. and this is a you know com, you know busy table i would li just like to point out to this red uh, mark things that i have the theta 1 2 measures at, at about uh, 33 degree and theta 2 3 around 42 degree uh, and uh, for normal ordering and for inverted ordering it is around 49 degree and i have theta 2 3 theta 1 3 around 9 degree so i have two large mixing and one small mixing angle and I have uh, this delta m squared 2, 1, which is the solar mass squared difference, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 5 EV squared, and delta m squared atmospheric, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 EV squared. So I have two mass squared differences, three neutrinos, two mass squared differences well measured, three angles well measured, but there is some problem with this theta 2, 3 angle, and I will tell you what are the unknown parameters. So we can see that this is the theta 2, 3 here, and we see this red is the normal ordering and blue is the inverted ordering. So we can see that theta 2, 3 is in the second octant from this figure that it is greater than um, pi by 4. And, uh, and the, here this red is the Red is the normal ordering. So you can see that this is a, these are the plots of the chi-square versus the parameters. So here you can see that the normal ordering has a lower chi-square. So the normal ordering is preferred. And for delta CP, we have a minima around 270, but the, which is around, uh, but the plus 90 is sort of ruled out. It is around three sigma. I don't know because I am not at full screen if this is very clear. But this is around three sigma, the 90 degree, it is disfavored. However, these parameters are not so precisely measured. The octant of theta 2, 3, whether it is in the first octant or in the second octant, because for the inverted ordering, I can see it is in the second octant. For normal ordering, there is very little difference between these two chi-squares. Delta CP in this octant is preferred. And uh, I talked about three mixing angles, but uh, when we are having the mixing matrix and three generations, we can have three more phases. And neutrino oscillation is sensitive to one phase, which is called the Dirac phase. They are not sensitive to two other phases, which are called Majorana phases. And they are also not sensitive to absolute masses, as I have said. So these are all unknown parameters. So what is the main problem? What is the challenge that these parameters remained unknown? And the main problem is that there are some degeneracies. And degeneracies means different set of parameters giving the same probability. So when we fit the data, what we do is we, the schematically, one calculates the flux times the cross section times the probability. And if the both probabilities for different parameters are equal, then different parameters will give equally good fit to the data. And it is known for, from a long time that there are this kind of degeneracies and they are mainly due to the delta CP phase because the delta CP phase can take values from 0 to 2 pi. So for instance, I can have normal hierarchy and inverted hierarchy giving me same solution for two different delta CP values. This is called the hierarchy delta CP degeneracy. Similarly, I to told you that the in vacuum oscillation, the probability is dependent on sine square 2 theta. So there is an intrinsic octant degeneracy, and there can also be octant delta CP degeneracy that in opposing octants due to different delta CP, we get the same probability. 
so in uh, 2015 in one paper we showed that you know because these three are remaining quantities so we should have a comprehensive approach and we can define a generalized hierarchy theta 2 3 delta cp degeneracy and this is a uh, i show an example how the degenerate solution looks like and this is for the experiment nova which is an accelerator based experiment uh, in fermi lab which is still running so this is in the delta cp theta 2 3 plane and this red and blue um, are for different hierarchy so this blue is the true solution so i simulated the data this blue is my true solution and i showed that when i do a uh, data, um, i this is with the simulated data we showed that corresponding to this true solution we can get equally acceptable solution so this is the wrong hierarchy solution uh, but this is the same octant but this is the wrong hierarchy solution but in the opposite octant so you can see that although this blue is my true solution this and this magenta is my wrong solution i can get many wrong solutions so then unambiguous determination of parameters become difficult and here this was with the six years of nova only neutrino data so the nova experiment any accelerated experiment can run in neutrino mode and anti neutrino mode and um, here i show the that if i combine the neutrino and anti neutrino mode then at least the wrong octant solution can be removed so combination of different channels and as i will say let's show later combination of different experiments can help in removing these degenerate solutions so that is one of the challenge there are additional challenges for instance cp violation is manifest in differences between neutrino and anti neutrino probabilities as i have showed you in my uh, first oscillation slide that when i go from neutrino to anti neutrino the mixing angle u goes to u star because there is a delta cp phase so that will change sign so this is manifest in difference between neutrino and anti neutrino probabilities this is small difference so one needs large data samples and systematic uncertainties play an important role for in this so here for instance is a plot for dune experiment which is an uh, proposed upcoming experiment in fermi lab and here i plot the sigma as a fun this is the cp violation cp discovery potential of dune and this this line this yellow dotted line is with no systematics and um, then you can see if we add systematics then my different uh, level then my sensitivity will uh, reduce and when we are talking about uh, when we are talking about precision measurements then this is a very important point and so for this near detectors are helpful so in all the experiments there is a near detector which will measure the cross section and measure the flux and that can help in uh, reducing the systematic uncertainty and and i will discuss later that you know in the past few years the other aspect has been very very um, popular and very active field so these are the future goals i think it is somewhat clear that first of all is determination of hierarchy octant and cp phase these are the immediate goals and in which synergy between different channels like neutrino at the uh, if the new mu uh, from the accelerator experiment we have a new mu beam it can go to new e so we can measure the probability of new mu going to new e we can also measure the survival probability of a new mu remaining new mu so combination of these two channels can um, these two um, uh, channels can also help us then uh, so that is the synergy and then uh, probing new physics in oscillation experiments so with this uh, high precision new st high statistics uh, high precision experiments it is also realized that one can perhaps probe uh, physics beyond the standard model in this uh, oscillation experiment so that is also a very active area then there are search for dark matter in neutrino facilities and probing bsm physics through new uh, interactions these are emerging goals and in the past 3 4 years lot of work has been done especially in the past two years in these areas so this is a snapshot of the current and the future experiments so this red are the beam experiments i talked about uh, uh, nova and dune there is also the t2k experiment in japan and i talked about the super kamiokande and then there 
are the T2HK hypercamiocande. These are the upgraded version of T2HK is upgraded version of T2K. And hypercamiocande is the upgraded version of uh, supercamiocande. So these green ones are atmospheric. There is also the Indian proposal, India-based neutrino observatory and also Pingu in uh, Ice Cube and then Orca. And there are the reactor experiments, Diabe and uh, the future experiment, Juno. Uh, so Diabe has measured theta-1,3 with precision and Juno is uh, also sensitive to the mass hierarchy. So different experiments can give us information of different, on different neutrino parameters. And the, um, these are the salient features. The main thing to note is that they are at different baselines. For instance, T2K, T2HK, they are at 295 kilometer, NOVA at 810, and DUNE is at 1300 kilometer. And as we go to higher baselines, the matter effect, these neutrinos are passing through the Earth, becomes more and more important. There is also an European proposal, ESS New SB, which has a baseline of 540 kilometer. Another thing is that they use different detector technology. So one is the water Cherenkov technology, which is uh, used, will be used by ESS New SB, then Hyper-K and uh, T2HK. And then Dune will use the liquid argon technology and NOVA is a scintillator detector. So there are uh, different uh, detector technologies and these are all very, you can see this next generation experiments are higher intensity than the previous generation experiments like T2K and NOVA. So they are, um, they are bigger detectors and, and also bigger in volume. And uh, the atmospheric neutrino detectors also, they are using different detector technology, like I have water, the, um, I, um, the Indian proposal, which is the INO, it has a magnetized iron calorimeter detector. So it uh, can uh, identify the charge of the uh, leptons. And so it can differentiate between the neutrinos from the antineutrinos because neutrinos will produce muons and antineutrinos will produce antimuons. So that way they can differentiate INO as that is the unique thing about INO. Hypercamiocande is a, it has no charge ID, but it can, uh, it can, it is sensitive to electrons, whereas INO is sensitive only to the muon. So there are these kind of uh, different aspects of different detectors. And uh, the path length of the atmospheric neutrinos is 10 to 10,000 kilometers. So the matter of the atmospheric neutrinos can pass through the Earth's core and matter effects are very, very important here. So that's why I thought I will just discuss a little bit about the matter effect because so far I have discussed the vacuum oscillation. And in matter, on the electron neutrinos undergoes a charge current interaction which induces an effective potential which depends on the, on the density. So what happens is that the mixing angle in matter changes depending on the density and the energy. And here you can see that if delta m square cos 2 theta is equal to 2 root 2 gf any, the mixing angle and meter in matter can be enhanced to pi by 4. And this is the famous Mikhaev's mean of Wolfenstein resonance. Why this is important is that the resonance occur for neutrinos. If for the antineutrinos, actually, this potential has a plus sign, has a different sign. It is so this denominator has a plus sign. So resonance occurs for delta m square less than zero. So the matter effect is sensitive to the ordering of the mass states. That is the very, very important aspect of uh, matter effect. So this is a snapshot uh, that in vacuum, we have the effective Hamiltonian, we have the eigenstates, but in matter, I have different eigenstates because the potent, the Hamiltonian changes and the matter mixing angle is defined with respect to the matter states. So that, that's why we have to treat the propagation in matter in, uh, in a different way because of this um, extra interaction. So this is the Dune experiment, which has a 1300 kilometer baseline for the FAD detector. So it is sensitive to the matter effect. And this, there is, as I said, that there is also a near detector and Dune has three near detectors. One is the sand and the, another is the liquid uh, argon. So this is on axis, which means it is in the same direction as the FAD detector. And this is something called off axis, which is slightly um, at a different uh, angle. Uh, and the neutrino beam comes at a different angle. And so this, there is a liquid argon detector and there is another near detector. And, uh, and uh, this is called the dune prism. 
So this is around uh, 400 meter from that. This is 1300 kilometer and this is around 400 meter. So, so this is what Dune can do. I will, I show that, you know, I told you that the mass hierarchy and CP and octant are the three remaining quantities. And this is what uh, Dune can do. So this in one year, Dune can have three sigma, uh, it is about 40 kiloton Dune uh, uh, mass, and then it can have about, uh, so it is uh, root delta chi square is about, uh, it's more than two sigma. Uh, no, sorry, this is uh, two sigma, this is sigma, sorry. So this can have about five sigma sensitivity for depending on the delta CP. So the hierarchy sensitivity will depend on the delta CP. So this is showing the delta CP minus pi by two, and it can have about five sigma hierarchy sensitivity in one year. And that is because of the matter effect. So right now the experiments running at T2K and NOVA, which are about 295 kilometer and 810 kilometer. So the matter effect is not that high. And I showed you that the matter effect is different for neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. And so it is different for the different mass ordering. And that's that's why it has a uh, good hi hierarchy sensitivity because it is the neutrinos are experiencing the matter effect. And this is the CP sensitivity. So this is six years for about five sigma for these values of delta CP. Mm. And this is uh, for this blue is for, you know, 100% delta CP values in 10 years, it can reach five sigma. So because uh, here also the CP sensitivity is better because the CP sensitivity is right now not so good because of degeneracies like the hierarchy delta CP degeneracy that I told. And Dune, because of good hierarchy sensitivity can address these degeneracies. And, uh, and then the I talked about the synergy. So I thought I will give one example of a synergy. And uh, synergy means that, you know, different experiments have different L and E dependence, and therefore the dependence on oscillation probability can be different. So supposing I have two degenerate solutions for experiment one, and experiment two has this solution, and uh, this is two degenerate solutions. But when I combine experiment one and two, then this will be my solution. So which means that I, by combining experiments, I can remove degeneracies. And because the atmospheric neutrinos and long baseline neutrinos are passing through different baselines and they have different energies, so they are combining them can help in elevating these degeneracies. And uh, I will show you one example using the INO combination of INO and T2K plus NOVA, which we did. And as I said, INO is a magnetized iron detector and it can identify neutrinos and antineutrinos and it is sensitive to the atmospheric neutrinos. So what we showed is that this is the CP discovery sensitivity of T2K and NOVA, which means how much it can separate the value of zero and 180, which are CP conserving values from CP violating values like maximal CP violation is minus 90 and plus 90. And here we can see this green line is the line only T2K and NOVA. And this red line is if we, red or blue line, see if we add uh, INO um, atmospheric neutrino data with T2K and NOVA. So we can see that in this side, the T2K and NOVA sensitivity was not very good. But if we add INO, then the sensitivity can reach three sigma. Here it was less than two sigma. But here, this is chi square, so it can reach three sigma. And that's it. that is because this problem comes because of the hierarchy CP degeneracy. And INO can uh, resolve this degeneracy. And it is true for any other atmospheric neutrino experiment also. We showed with this example. So I, so far, I talked about just simple oscillation. But as I said that these new experiments are giving us the opportunity to probe new physics beyond SM in neutrino oscillation experiments. There are sterile neutrinos, non-standard interaction, non-unitarity of neutrino mixing matrices, CPT violation, long range force, unstable neutrinos, many such examples are considered. Now these are subleading effect because the data has a very good fit with oscillations. So these kind of effects, if they occur, they will be at a subleading effect and they change the oscillation probability. 
so we have to introduce these new terms in the Hamiltonian and solve the propagation equation and find the probabilities either analytically or numerically. And this changes the oscillation probabilities. So the one question is, what is the impact on the three neutrino picture? Because there are extra parameter and extra degeneracies. So how does it affect the three neutrino um, picture that I described so far? Also, how this experiment constrain the, can constrain the new physics parameters? So I will just discuss the sterile neutrinos because of the recent interest in these. And uh, so the question is that whether there are extra sterile neutrinos or not, and the sterile neutrinos are inert neutrinos. So they are not interacting with the other standard model particles. And the sterile neutrinos first became popular with the LSND results in 1995. LSND observed nu mu nu e bar oscillation at a distance of L about 30 meter. And uh, this, uh, this needed, so they, uh, they observed about four sigma excess of uh, nu e bar over the background. So this is the data. And this required a mass square difference of the order of 0.2 EV square. Now I have told that the solar mass square is 10 to the minus five EV square, atmospheric was minus three. So I need another independent delta M square. So I need another um, mass state to be introduced. Otherwise, I cannot have three independent delta M square. So this is what I am showing pictorially. This is the LSND solution, and this is the atmospheric, and this is the solar. So now why this additional neutrino has to be sterile? Because we have some constraints from the Z decay that the um, uh, Z decay, which means this, that how many neutrinos can take part in standard model interactions? because the Z decay constraints the number of neutrinos having standard model introduction. So that is close to three. So the additional neutrino has to be sterile. That is no standard model interaction. Then the Miniboon experiment uh, first in uh, 2013 confirmed the Miniboon experiment was designed to test the LSND results, whether the LSND result is really uh, showing neutrino oscillation or it is some systematic error. So Miniboon experiment has the same L by E as LSND, but with a different L, a different E, and a different detector, so that the systematic effects can be um, addressed. And uh, Miniboon uh, gave their, um, this in 2018, they gave their new mu new e oscillation results. And earlier, they had given new mu bar, new e bar oscillation results, like search results. And see, this is the Miniboon, uh, this is the Miniboon data. So they, they also found an excess and uh, the combined significance of LSND and Miniboon is about six sigma for appearance of new E bar. And if one does a fit of this sector only, then one can see these blue regions, shaded regions are the LSND allowed regions. And these lines, this black, red, these are the regions of Miniboon at different confidence level. This orange one is four sigma of uh, Miniboon. So we can see that combined LSND and Miniboon gives allowed region with a oscillation in this you know, high values of delta M square. However, there is, uh, okay, an additional support also came uh, for this from something called the reactor anomaly, where the reactor neutrino fluxes were recalculated and there were many reactor neutrino experiments which measured and reactors measured the disappearance probability like, uh, like the new E is new E bar from re new reactors are disappearing into some flavor, other flavor, but the reactors are measuring how much flux of new E bar is remaining. And that is that is the survival channel, the new e bar, new e bar, and what? So this is given by one minus the conversion probability, and all these reactor uh, results were earlier consistent with no oscillation. However, the reactor neutrino flux was recalculated, and it was found that it is slightly higher than the earlier value, and so that they also lend support to. Um, oscillation and another scale, extra scale like 2.4 EV square. There is also the gallium source experiment where the 51 chromium, the electron capture, and there also um, the there was some uh, indication of a of a deficit, and that is also lend support to this. 
However, there is a, although the LSND and Miniboon can provide a solution to the, uh, with a high delta M squared, they are consistent. There is also a tension between different disappearance and appearance or the survival and conversion channels. So there are, apart from LSND and Miniboon, there are other experiments like uh, different experiments, CDHS, then MINOS, then uh, double show um, ice cube, they all provided the P nu mu bar nu mu bar and they analyzed the um, disappearance in terms of uh, uh, sterile neutrinos and this black area is the, they don't observe anything and this black area is the area, this area right of the black line is disfavored by the combined disappearance searches. And this red area is the allowed area from the mini boon and uh, LSND. So you can see that there is a tension between these two. So, so the although the sterile neutrino can provide a good fit, but there is also some tension. Another thing which mini boon observed was, which is called the low energy excess. So at low energy, it observed some excess events. And this green is the background, which is the here, the background can be due to electron neutrinos. And this yellow is the background, which is due to uh, photons. So the question was that whether this is a background effect, this low energy excess is a background effect. And also the mini boon cannot distinguish between the uh, uh, photons and single electrons. So they cannot distinguish between Cherenkov cone of electrons and single photons. And the single photons, uh, but uh, coming from the new NC background, cannot explain the excess. So the also, if we have the sterile neutrino scenario to fit the low energy excess, then it cannot fit the low energy excess. So there were many alternative explanations which were proposed to address the um, uh, this low energy excess of mini boon. And uh, these are basically like, you know, one example is a heavy sterile neutrino where these sterile neutrinos can give additional photons. And because mini boon cannot distinguish between photons and uh, electrons, then these photons can cause a mimic the electron like signal. And uh, there is also some dark uh, photon model, which said that, you know, there is uh, this there is some extra uh, dark uh, dark uh, da dark uh, gauge bosons which can couple to the photon and then they can emit uh, e plus e minus so this is some extra interaction and uh, that these kind of things were also started and at the experimental level the short baseline neutrino program of fermi lab which has three detectors uh, and they will compare the fluxes in these three detectors where proposed to address this uh, LSND mini boon uh, issue, low energy excess plus sterile oscillation. And among this, the micro boon experiment has uh, given their data last year. It started taking data since 2015. And this is a liquid argon detector. And the liquid argon, the Dune main detector is also a liquid argon detector. And the primary goal is to identify the mini boon low energy excess. And it can separate the electrons and photons because it has excellent uh, resolution. The liquid argon detectors has excellent resolution. So, so this uh, uses the same beam and similar baseline, but different detector technology. And so this is the micro boon uh, result. First of all, it disfavored the, um, the photon, the you know neutral current photon emission as origin of the low energy excess. And then they also say in this paper that there is no electron neutrino excess in the data. So this black is the observation. And um, this is the low energy, this gray area is the with, uh, without low energy uh, excess. And this red is the prediction of low energy excess. So you can see that they are not supporting the low energy excess. However, in, uh, in a later paper, uh, the authors of this paper showed that the uh, that this is not not really model independent. It uh, it depends on how they are unfolding the mini boon data uh, and to fit and to get the conclusion for the micro boon. And uh, that is what they they said. And uh, then uh, whether the, so the new physics. What are the implications for the various new physics possibilities? That is also one of the very open areas. And also the results from SBN, uh, the short baseline neutrino, the other detectors are also very important at this juncture. 
And the status of the three plus one uh, feet with the micro boon is that the three plus one feet is uh, still allowed. The chi square has reduced slightly, but it is uh, still allowed. So this is the delta m square. It has not much change, but the mixing angle is slightly larger, and uh, u mu four square. U E four square does not change much. So when I have four neutrinos, then like three neutrinos, I said three mixing angles. I when I have four neutrinos, then I have more number of mixing angles, uh, number of phases, number of, will also increase. So the three plus one feet is still allowed with the sterile neutrino. Now another thing which I want to discuss, which has lot of work is being done, is the how the one can probe BSN physics in near detectors. The near detectors, as I said, were proposed for the um, for the um, for reducing the systematic uncertainties. But it has been realized that many uh, new physics like dark matter, heavy neutral leptons, action-like particles, extra neutral gauge bosons, etc., um, uh, can be um, uh, you know probed in these near detectors. So this is a, so this is a physics report. It is a snow mass report, and it is a physics report where you can find a lot of these examples. This is one example from uh, this paper which I show. So here, for instance, you know what happens is a proton beam hits a target and produces mesons, and they are passing through the earth and going to the dew near detector. So here, if there is a dark photon which is mixing with the ordinary photon, and then they can give rise to some uh, scalars. And this can uh, interact via the dark photon to the to produce the electron signal signature. Now, the, so the idea is that the photon couples to another dark photon, and the dark, there is a dark sector, and that dark sector can be probed in these uh, detectors. So there are many many examples, many many studies in this, and I thought I will give one example of a study of our show one result which is a recent result of ours. So we considered standard model augmented by extra U1 and we showed how we can, um, we can probe this model at the dune near detector. So this contains an extra boson. So when I have an extra U1 group, then it will contain an extra. I had in the standard model, the W and Z boson. So in this U1 uh, group will give me an extra boson, which is called Z prime. And we considered the neutrino electron scattering and dune near detector. The main reaction in, in uh, dune is the neutrino nucleon quasi elastic scattering, then for higher energy, deep in elastic. But it was realized that with uh, suitable energy cut, one can also use the neutrino new electron scattering for studies of BSM physics. In fact, these are some references where neutrino electron scattering to probe BSM physics have been studied. There are many others. I have just put some references. And so what happens is that in the neutrino electron scattering is a clean channel. And if I have an extra Z prime, then I will have additional diagrams. So I will have additional contribution. And I can also have interference between different diagrams. And that we have found that gives some interesting signature. So here are uh, some results that we show. So this, these are some the extra, you know, ch the, if I have an extra U1 model, then I will have some extra U1 charges of the particles corresponding to this extra U1 charge for the fermions. And we show that the how the mass and the coupling of the Z prime can be uh, constrained from Dune. So this pink line is the Dune constraint. So this means that Dune, um, Dune will be ruling out this portion, these shaded regions, and this uh, will be allowed. And so we can see that in certain N mass and uh, certain mass range uh, and coupling range, Dune can give better constraint than these are these shaded regions are constrained from some other experiments. Um, so Dune can give some better constraints. That's what we found. So you can see that there are also a host of other experiments. For instance, you know the coherent experiment, which is the neutrino electron coherent scattering, can give constraints on these kind of scenarios. And um, there are a Barber experiment, uh, which is uh, which can also constrain these kind of scenarios. So, so there are uh, so apart from the neutrino oscillation experiment, also there are other experiments 
which are considered for uh, constraining this BSM physics, uh, the beam dump experiments where, you know, the um, neutrinos will, uh, uh, the beam will uh, uh, interact with some nucleons and then they can produce some uh, new physics uh, particles. So various experiments are considered. So this is a recent result that we have obtained. So now I will uh, just uh, um, on the theoretical side, why our thing is that why neutrino masses are so small. So I have showed you the mass square differences 10 to the minus 5 EV square, 10 to the minus 3 EV square. And from cosmology, we know that the sum of neutrino masses is less than about 0 0.23 electron volt, the most uh, stringent bound. So which means that the neutrino mass is very small. And why the neutrino mass is so small and one natural way is to explain via the seesaw mechanism which relates the smallness of neutrino masses with some new physics at high scale and the tree level exchange of some heavy particle gives rise to um, effective dimension 5 operator at low scale. So this is the famous Weinberg operator and this the coefficient of this can be related to the neutrino mass via the seesaw mechanism. And if I have LL phi phi term and this violates lepton number. So, and if lepton number is violated, that means neutrinos are Majorana nature, they are their own antiparticle. Also, you know, if there is lepton number violation, then it can give rise to leptogenesis, which can explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. So there are also other models like radiative mass generation models with higher dimensional operators which can give rise to small neutrino masses. And another is the what explains the mixing pattern. I told you there are two large and one small mixing, but in the quark sector, we know that all mixing angles are small. So why the mixing pattern is like this? So the main study in this is the flavor symmetry. There are many uh, non-abelian symmetries. Also people study in the context of grand unified theories, different textures. And this is one, um, figure which showed that you know how the delta cp values for instance how the precision measurements of oscillation parameters can constrain models so supposing my delta cp is minus 90 then i can say that a lot of these models the flavor symmetry is of course difficult to rule out but for instance the anarchy models will not be preferred so uh, these kind of things can be done with the precision measurement of the neutrino oscillation parameters can also at least help to rule out certain models. So, you know, I have come to the end of my talk and I talked mainly about neutrino oscillation and probing BSM physics in neutrino oscillation, but neutrinos are connected to different sectors. I talked about um, baryogenesis via leptogenesis and I also talked about neutrinoless double beta decay and neutrinos uh, can also be studied neutrino mass models in collider physics. Also, its impact on Higgs, the vacuum stability of Higgs have been studied, charged lepton flavor violation, then uh, neutrinos, uh, common origin of neutrino mass and dark matter, that is also a, a very a popular area of study, apart from probing uh, dark matter in neutrino experiments, then neutrinos in cosmology, also a very important and very emerging topic of multi-messenger astronomy, which has become very important after the ice cube results that apart from gravitational waves and cosmic rays, we can also use neutrinos uh, to probe the universe. So I could not touch that part at all. And also the nutri nuclear interactions, uh, neutrino interactions, cross sections, the coherent experiments and the coherent electron neutrino scattering experiments. They are also very important in probing the beyond standard model physics. So there are uh, vast areas and I could not cover uh, many uh, of the important areas. So in the concluding remark, I would like to say this, that there is remarkable progress in past decade in unraveling oscillation parameters and three flavor paradigm is well established. And with this uh, new um, generation detectors, there are a lot of efforts and a lot of studies to probe BSM physics, both oscillation and non-oscillation at neutrino detectors. However, the origin of neutrino masses and mixing, it's uh, still under mist. So I would uh, like to uh, uh, finish my talk here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a really, really interesting talk, Surabhati. Um, um, there are a number of questions in the Q&A panel. Um, just before we get to those, could you say a couple of things? You, at one of your graph, I think slides, it might have been slide 14 or 13, I forget. You had a table or maybe a bit later, you had a table of the, um, accepted, the accepted parameter values. Could we just have a quick look at that? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Now, uh, it, this, this table of parameter values assumes only the, the three flavor model, does it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and, uh, and is it the case that all known experiments are consistent with these um, values? Yeah, so this is the, this comes from the global feed in which the data from all the experiments, solar, Atmospheric neutrino experiments, the accelerator and the reactor experiments all are included. Right. And um, in fact, uh, if you see here, they give some, this is from the new feature collaboration. And here they give uh, without SK atmospheric and with SK atmospheric. So these right. are their dashed and line. So I guess there is some issues with the analysis of the SK atmospheric neutrino data. And so they are giving the values uh, with and without that. But all the known uh, experiments are, all the experiments that have given data are included in obtaining this table. So this is the 2021. So they keep on upgrading this table. So, uh, okay. So, uh, and to formulate this table, they haven't introduced any, uh, any uh, sterile neutrinos, for example, or any, or any no, new no, physics? No, no, no. This is only, no, this is only, the three generation fit. With sterile neutrinos, people also do global fit in a three plus one picture. And I have not shown those results, but right. because there are you know, other parameters, and these parameters don't change that much because uh, it constrains mainly the sterile sector and three plus one can give a, give a fit to the uh, this, uh, these parameters do not change very much by this uh, sterile neutrino fit. Okay, I see. Right. Oh, that's very interesting. What is because um, the sterile neutrinos are a little higher mass than these. So that yeah. oscillation is sort of little decoupled. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so the low energy excess doesn't isn't relevant to this table? Low energy excess is not relevant. So this is the just the three flavor paradigm. Okay. All right. So uh, the first question in the Q&A box is, are there any efforts to search for non-relativistic neutrinos? I.e. Uh, Parkhamov suggests the periodic variations in beta decay radius due to gravitational lensing relics or ultra low energy neut uh, neutrinos. Are you aware of any of this or? I have not worked on this. Are you talking about the relic neutrinos which are the, um, which are the, um, you know, the produced from the um, uh, Big Bang or? Well, I guess the essence of the question is, is it, has there been anything done with uh, or measurements carried out on what would be regarded as truly non-relativistic neutrinos? So this, uh, the very low energy neutrinos, the yeah. Big Bang neutrinos, there are some experiments. It's very difficult because they are very low energy, but I think there are yeah. experiments like Ptolemy, I am not much, very much aware of the details, but I, there are some uh, some efforts in that direction. Right. I, very recently, there also one paper came on archive on this, but I have not taken a look at that. Right. Uh, Peter Price would like to know if you have four neutrinos, this is going beyond the three neutrino model, uh, do you get six mixing angles? What are the role of the other two mixing angles likely to have? Yeah, yeah, that is a very important question. And you know, something I am working on also, but here I did not show that. So yes, I have three mixing angles. I, I can parameterize in terms of theta one, four, theta two, four, and theta three, four. And what happens is that, and you know, not only three mixing angles, I have more phases also, yeah. two more phases. So what happens is that, that this sensitivity that I am talking about, these sensitivities can get, um, can get, you know, um, can get um, worse 
because there can be additional degeneracy due to these nutrients. So I have talked about the degeneracy which are only relevant to the free neutrino paradigm. But I have, if I have a fourth neutrino, then the degeneracy can, um, can increase because of these parameters. And in fact, it can be shown, there are papers which have showed that the octane sensitivity becomes very poor for the low, for these long baseline experiments like T2K, NOVA, the octane sensitivity becomes poorer. Uh, so, so that happens that even the hierarchy sensitivity, CP sensitivity all suffers because of these extra mixing angles and extra phases. And this is in fact some, one of my ongoing work that I am doing. And what we are trying to show is that if we compare, combine the atmospheric neutrinos and the long baseline neutrinos, then how this problem can be addressed. So that is what we are working on right now. And there are papers which have shown how these uh, extra parameters in, um, introduce new degeneracies and uh, affect the determination of hierarchy of and And if a fourth neutrino exists, is it is it a reasonable guess that it would have to be a sterile new, neutrino, may arm a particle of some sort, or does it allow for the possibility of, you know, from time to time there have been hypotheses, I believe, about right-handed neutrinos having very large masses, for example. So, yeah, so the sterile neutrino, I just talked about, uh, you know, low-scale sterile neutrinos. But mm -hmm. for instance, when I talk about CISO model, then, you know, sterile neutrinos are, uh, it's very curious because they exist at all energy scales. So for instance, when I talk about uh, the CISO model, then I can have, a, that can be the, which is the, you know, known as the type one CISO. I say that it is mediated by some heavy particle. So that yeah. is mediated by a, Maybe right-handed sterile neutrino, which from the point of view of grand unification was initially thought to be of the mass of, you know, uh, 10 to the uh, 14 um, uh, at, at, or something. At the, grand, but, at the grand unified scale type of thing. At the grand unified scale. However, yeah. when collider LHC data came, then there were a lot of studies that whether the neutrinos can be probed in collider. So there came the TV scale models. In fact, I had one slide, somehow I forgot to include it. And the TV scale models are like, you know, they can give a large mixing between the active and the sterile neutrinos. And then you can probe them at the colliding. Then also there are models where, you know, the KV scale sterile neutrinos, which can be dark matter. The EV scale sterile neutrinos cannot be the dark matter because they will free stream and they will wash out the structure which is needed. But the cleanly scale sterile neutrinos, they are, can be dark matter. So the sterile neutrinos exist at different scales. But for the SND mini boon anomaly, we need EV scale sterile neutrino. Unless we can also have the other solutions like these uh, different other solutions that are alternative solutions that are proposed. Yeah. But uh, that are mainly for the low energy excess. Yes. I don't know if they can solve the LSND data. So. Right. Right. Uh, the next question is from Joan Vaccaro, who would like to know, could you please say something about the low energy detection threshold and the abundance of the undetected neutrinos, Big Bang remnants, and their potential effects on dark matter candidates? Uh, you know, I am not very uh, sure of this because I really not worked in this and they are very low energy neutrinos. And um, yeah. just recently I found one paper where they were trying to use some nuclear effect, uh, nuclear recoil uh, kind of things. But um, I am not an expert to comment on this. Uh, really. I have not looked into it very detailed. Right. Um uh, um, Chris, Chris Scott gave a reference for people to uh, look at an, an archive paper. So that's there. If people are interested, you can glance at it in the Q&A panel. Uh, Ryan Savage wants to know how significant is the change of the flavor, changing probabilities when you include sterile neutrinos? Is it a big effect or is it a, I think you mentioned it was a small effect at one stage. 
Uh, yeah, see, the it will depend on the mixing angles. And yeah. right now, the mixing angles are about you know five degree. If we do a three plus one global fit, uh, then all these angles are of the order of a five degree, six degree. So. Right. What I have seen is that, you know, if I take this mixing angle as 9 degree, then I will get, uh, supposing my, I get 5 degree, then my uh, sensitivity can increase from uh, 2 sigma to 3 sigma. Of Supposing I am talking about octane determinant uh, in presence of sterile neutrinos, like whether theta 2, 3 is greater than pi by 4 or less than pi by 4. Right. Um, and uh, I have seen that if I take the angle as 9 degree, I will get a kind of two sigma sensitivity in octet, and if I get a five degree, I'm getting about three sigma. So there are indeed some effects, but you know these effects will also depend on your baseline uh, whether matter effects are important or not. Uh, most of the studies so far have been for vacuum oscillations, and what we are doing is in uh, presence of matter, and uh, there also it can affect the resonance condition. So these are. Uh, there are things which can get affected, but uh, at the chi-square level, significance level, I saw about one sigma difference if we go to a smaller. So more the smaller the mixing angle is, the less the effect is. We are more close to the three generation in terms of the mixing angles. Right. Um, but in terms of the phases, which can give rise to extra degeneracy. So, for instance, when we are doing our study, we are taking one of the mixing angles, theta 3, 4, to be zero, because the zero value is still allowed. And I have seen that if I take that theta 3, 4 to be non-zero, then the sensitivities are getting much worse. Right. So, yeah, it depends on the parameters also. Right. So, if you do um, introduce, for example, a fourth, new, a fourth neutrino, is there is it reasonable? Are there any reasonable estimates as to what the mass uh, difference will be between that fourth, or is required to be between that fourth neutrino and the other three? Is there a broad area? Yeah. Of, so uh, oh, that's it here. Right. See, this is like point uh, two zero nine or point one nine one. So. Right. If you consider my slide, I will tell you in that slide. In fact, I also had a slide on that and I didn't show it. So I have this normal hierarchy, 3 to 1. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I can have a fourth neutrino above it. You yeah. know? And there are also constraints from cosmology on how many additional neutrinos you can introduce. Right. Because when 3 plus 1 was not giving good fit earlier, people considered 3 plus 2. But 3 plus 1 is more favored from cosmology. And right. so above this, this will be about, you know, 0.17, like 0.2 EV square or so. So I will have one state here. Right. Right. So if, so if, we are, if it is required that, that we go beyond the standard model, uh, is it necessary that that fourth uh, neutrino uh, be sterile, or could it in fact be associated with um, a heavier still uh, lepton, you know, electron, yeah. muon, tau, and something else with a much, much higher um, energy, which nevertheless has an associated standard left-handed uh, neu uh, neutrino? Is, is that ruled out by experimentation? Core generation models are heavily constrained from the CK mixing. Oh, as I far see. as I know, that you know, four generation models are very heavily constrained. People do consider, but uh, I think they are very heavily constrained. And right. actually, you can have models where you can have the heavy neutrino and the light neutrino. And uh, these are some extended seesaw schemes where you can have a you know, this is a model, how you can get a EV scale sterile neutrino in a model. And there are piece of schemes where you can have high scale sterile neutrinos and low scale sterile neutrinos. Right, I see. Well, there are no more questions in the Q&A panel. So maybe I could just finish up by asking you to give a wild speculation. What, what do you think or what is the current thinking of, about the, the best model for the origin of the neutrino masses? Is it is a Higgs mechanism ruled out totally? 
do they have to be Mayramba particles? Um, what What do you think is the most likely uh, explanation, or what one appeals so to you the most? You know, we can add a right-handed neutrino in the standard model, and we can, or some singlet state, and we can give a neutrino mass. Uh, like we give for the Higgs mechanism, that yeah. coupling have to be very, very small. And uh, so what happens is that then there are no other consequences apart from neutrino oscillation that we see. Because that kind of small coupling cannot be probed in any other, it is like 10 to the minus 13 or something. So yeah. it cannot be probed in any other experiment. So I find this much more interesting where we have a lot of uh, Majorana neutrino, where we have a lot of scopes for, you know, testing like neutrino-less double beta decay, which can be at least there are experiments which can say, tell us. Right. So that way I find that option much more interesting. Right. Because otherwise there is nothing much to do if uh, <laughs> neutrinos yes. are having... Yes. Like yeah. in that sense, like okay, in the oscillation, we will always have things, but... Well, thank you very much, Rabbi. So I that find was my a, life more less, 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 less interesting. The uh, Mayor Arma particles. More interesting. More, more interesting. Mayor. Okay, right. Yes. All more right. Fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was a really fascinating talk. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending.